Aloha and welcome to Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kili Iakina, your host and president of the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii. Well, it doesn't matter where you're from, whether you're in Japan or in Europe or anywhere in the United States, you have now heard about the Honolulu Rail. Recently, the Wall Street Journal did an expose and dubbed us perhaps the worst boondoggle of public works in the United States. Ouch, that hurts. <laughs> Lucky we live Hawaii. But today, we're going to take a deep look into the auditing of the rail. Hawaii's project today that has become of national renown. I have an expert with me today because her job is to do just that. Take a look at the rail project and make sure that it's on track, so to speak. She's a councilwoman for the Council District 2 of Honolulu City and County, which is a vast region on the island of Oahu. And she's been tracking the rail for a while, even before she was elected. Today, my guest is somebody who's becoming rapidly well-known all across the state because of her strong views on the rail. Her name is Heidi Tsuneyoshi, Councilwoman of the Honolulu City Council. I'm going to welcome her to the program. Councilwoman Heidi, welcome to the program. Aloha and good afternoon. Thanks for having me on the show. It's a delight to have you on the program Thank today. You. you and I have similar heartbeats. We've been listening to and watching and talking about the rail for quite some time. Now, you're not new to city council, although you're in your first term. You actually worked there before. That's correct. I had the distinct privilege and honor to work for um, uh, Council Chair Ernie Martin, who was a council member before um, I began my term in January of 2019. And I did work with him for the full eight years of his term. So through the, that perspective, got to get a lot of insight into what it takes to um, be effective as a council member and what it takes to get out into the community and address concerns. So Now, you were working behind the scenes for many right. years for mm -hmm. Councilman Martin. And you Correct. basically learned every aspect of city council work. What caused you to throw your hat into the ring and run? That's a very good question. So um, I never thought I would go into politics. So I'll start with that. My background is um, in counseling psychology. So I was actually, before working with Council Member Martin, was working at Alelahua High School as a high-risk counselor with at-risk youth. So, high-risk counselor. I well, mean, at-risk counselor with high-risk youth. At-risk counselor. That's not a bad thing for the council <laughs> yeah, in any way. Right. <laughs> so I was um, very um, passionate about working in the social services and working with our communities and then had the opportunity to work with Chair Martin, who himself has a background in social work, so that was a fit. And then when he was coming towards the end of his term and knowing all that I knew about what we were working with in the communities and what the challenges we had moving forward, I really thought about it long and hard, talked it over with my family, and decided that it was something that I could do to serve at even a higher level for the people, as service has always been my main focus. I thought that was a good thing to do. And also, I have two daughters who are now 21 and 18 and thought that I really wanted to do my part to make sure that they had a Hawaii that they could be proud to call home. Well, so I decided to put my hat in the ring, if you will. <laughs> and, and now you're in the limelight quite a bit. In fact, rapidly moving into the limelight for a freshman on the council. I, I know that uh, I started to follow what you're doing when you started to talk about the rail. Because for many years, that has been a concern to me and the Grassroot Institute. I remember back when Mayor Mufi Hanneman began the program, we were talking in the early days about a $2.5 billion price tag. Right. Today, we're nearing the $10 billion price tag. And the rise in cost has been astronomical, whether people are supporting the rail or opposed to the rail. Right. Uh, it, it represents a real problem. Now, when did you start tracking the rail, and what made you become a little more concerned than the average citizen? Well, so um, as working as a staff member with Chair Martin, had heard many of the discussions that um, came before the city council from Hart, and at that time was just Hart, the, the Honolulu, Honolulu Area Authority, Rapid Transit Authority for Rapid Transit, correct? And when um, Hart officials would come to discuss the projected um, costs, projected deadlines. All of those kept changing over and over again. And as a staffer, I just had so much concerns about it. And then as I started in January of 2019, and as a council member, had the opportunity to see documentation and look into specifics as to what we were looking at, um, I had my concerns heightened even more because I saw information dating all the way back to 2007 that um, before Hart was even formed, almost $3 billion of money was already expended for the project. And so knowing that we knew even in 2007 and, 2000, and 2009 was the first audit that was done, and even at that point, there was concerns for lack of internal controls, lack of accountability, and um, having taken office in 2019, saw that there was a decade 
of time when um, different audits had been saying there's a lack of internal controls, there's concerns for accountability. And in, in the way I was looking at it, there is no real um, action towards bringing accountability to the, to the project. Well, let so me stop you there for, for, a for, audit. for a moment, mm -hmm. because the story you're telling is really astounding. You're saying that a project of this magnitude had problems uh, prop up early on, right. a decade ago or right. more, right. and no one was really paying attention to that. We didn't slow down and say, let's take a look at these problems, let's right. dig in a little deeper. Right. Why do you think that is? Why do you think the, there is so much momentum behind the train, so to speak, mm -hmm. that we didn't slow down and say, hey, we've got a correct course along the way? I think that... Um, from what I see now, I think there was a lot of just letting things go on in um, status quo. But the forensic audit is actually looking for if there was any internal breaches of internal controls. So that's really what the forensic audit, which I called for in Resolution 19-29, is looking to, to see. Was it intentional that we really weren't looking to how these internal controls were breached or how we were spending? A lot of people are looking at it saying, was there any purposeful fraud, waste, and abuse going on with this system? But what ultimately for myself at this point in time, what we need to do moving forward to make sure we don't have any more bleeding of taxpayer dollars. So. Well, you've been talking about and you have stood for a resolution in the council to right. bring about a forensic audit. Right. And congratulations on your initial Thank success you. in that. And Thank we're you. going to see one along the way right. soon enough. But you had mentioned other audits had taken place. Right. And in fact, one of the concerns raised when you began to say it's time to have a forensic audit is that other people said, wait a minute, this thing is audited all the time. Right. There are constant financial statements audits. Mm -hmm. There is federal government auditing its expenditures. Mm -hmm. There are audits by the state government. Right. So your opponent said, Heidi's just going to be wasting money with a forensic audit because we've already audited this quite a bit. But right. you used three words earlier that would kind of differentiate a forensic audit from the rest. And it was fraud, waste, and abuse. Right. Tell our viewers what exactly the forensic audit will do that no other audit has done. Right, thank you. So for um, previous audits done by the city and state, they looked at snapshots of time. This forensic audit is going to start from when we started collecting the GE in 2007 all the way up to now to see if there was any purposeful um, breaches of our internal controls that has um, left our assets unprotected, which is basically taxpayer dollars. So again, to see if there was a purposeful intent in not having um, true documentation or if there is anything that we need to look at as far as um, actions that were taken that caused the waste that we have. Seen so today. you're talking about, as you mentioned, the GE tax Correct. payments that were being made to help fund the rail. You're right. talking about the money. Right. That, that gives the impetus to the forensic audit in order, right. order to search what has been done with the money. So there's going to be a careful look to see whether there is intentionality there to right. misuse the money for fraud, waste, and abuse. Now, when, when you started to promote this audit for fraud, waste, and abuse, what were some of the areas in which you got a lot of pushback? Um, I think there was a concern for the cost of the audit because we had to, of course, appropriate the money through the city. Um, when the resolution was first heard, the resolution was drafted to where the heart was going to be the entity that would um, fund and um, look for the ex external auditor that we would be using. And there came concerns from the heart board. I did, after the resolution was heard at a committee meeting, go to attend the heart board um, meeting where they, the heart board discussed the resolution and they were in opposition to the resolution. So um, I brought the resolution back to the city council and said, if Hart is unwilling or unable to conduct the forensic audit, then I think that is within the scope of the Honolulu City Council, who has to oversee what's going to happen for rail many years from now. Hart is only chartered in the charter um, tasked with the construction of rail, but the city council, other councils beyond our time, are going to have to be taxed with even looking at the operation and maintenance. Now, so we didn't, brought back to the city council. Didn't Hart already have an audit? A forensic audit in its budget of five hundred thousand dollars that it ultimately voted down. Correct. They had had it as a line item previously. But to go back, what you said, one of the major pushbacks you got is this is going to be too expensive, which right. is kind of hard to fathom. You were going from two point five billion to ten billion dollars, right. inching up in the billions, mm -hmm. and we're not willing to spend even a few hundred thousand or the millions that it would take to do an right. audit. It doesn't seem to make sense because. Such a forensic audit could ultimately save you billions. 
Exactly. And that was my, my intention. And even now, as I talk to people who are for and against the audit, is that my intention is that I think this is the, um, the money that we need to spend is necessary. And in, in um, light of what we have spent and what we will continue to spend, it's a very small um, deposit, if you will, into what we need to do to be able to save a lot of money in the long run. So um, I'm, I'm very glad that we got the votes to push that out of the Honolulu City Council and that we will be working forward and moving forward into identifying who we were going to be um, uh, identifying to do that audit. Well, I want to congratulate you because you've been the spearhead really at the front end of getting this forensic audit going by the city and county. So you're to be commended for that. I know a couple of years ago, the Grassroot Institute came to the conclusion that our community and our leaders were pretty much divided, about 50-50, between being for the rail or against the rail. And we'd come to a standstill. But one of the things we learned through a campaign we ran called Audit the Rail is that it didn't matter where people were, whether they were pro-rail or anti-rail. They wanted an accounting of the money. Right. And so really you've been at the forefront of something that is actually a unifying factor amongst the people of Hawaii. And have you seen that too, that people are not so much fighting against each other in terms of pro-rail versus anti-rail. Right. People are rallying together, calling for accountability right. on the same page. I think that's very true, and I think that's really what drove me as a mother and as a daughter, is that the biggest question on everybody's mind is how much is this going to cost us? Because as we know, we have so many other things that we have to work on in the city. We have so many other core services that we have to manage. And um, on top of that, the cost of living in, in our island home is just so high that the, um, the concern is very real and very valid for people of all generations and generations to come as far as the decisions we make today and how that will impact um, individuals and families' ability to live here in Hawaii. So, When we come back from a short break in a couple of minutes, I'm going to ask you to give us some examples of potential fraud, waste, and abuse that factored into your proposal to conduct a forensic audit. But first, uh, quickly, if you could answer this question, how can we make sure that the forensic audit is going to be independent, that it's not going to be co-opted by the government or by members of the heart board? That's a very good question. Or the and administration. That, correct. And that's why we allocated up to $2 million to make sure that we have the capability to really look through all the qualifications. And if we have to go external out of state or wherever we have to go to make sure we get a good accounting of what we need to uncover with this um, rail project. So this is going to be an independent audit correct. that's going to have someone from the outside taking a careful look at what's going on inside. That is correct with no ties to Hart or the City Council. Well, very good. Well, thanks for your mana'o on this, and I'm looking forward to the good results. And when I come back from this short break, I will ask you, give me some real examples of potential fraud, waste, and abuse. My guest today is City Councilwoman Heidi Tsuneyoshi. She covers the region from, oh, about Mililani Mauka, up through Wahiwa, all the way up. It just goes up to the north part of the island. It's a vast region. But it's a very important region, and one of the interesting things is that the rail isn't going to go to her constituents. So I think they're a little bit up in arms as to the fact that uh, they're going to need to pay for it. We'll be right back. I'm Keili'i Akina on Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Together. Don't go away. Aloha. This is Winston Welch. I am your host of Out and About, where every other week, Mondays at 3, we explore a variety of topics in our city, state, nation, and world and uh, events, organizations, the people that fuel them. It's a really interesting show. We welcome you to tune in, and we welcome your suggestions for shows. Um, you got a lot of them out there, and we have an awesome uh, studio here where we can get your ideas out as well. So I look forward to you tuning in every other week where we've got some great guests and great topics. You're going to learn a lot. You're going to come away inspired like I do. So I'll see you every other week here at 3 o'clock on Monday afternoon. Aloha. Aloha and mabuhai. My name is Emmy Ortega Anderson, inviting you to join us every Tuesday here on Pinoy Power Hawaii with Think Tech Hawaii. We come to your home at 12 noon every Tuesday. We invite you to uh, listen, watch uh, for our mission of empowerment. We aim to enrich, enlighten, educate, entertain, and we hope to empower. 
Again, maraming salamat po, mabuhay, and aloha. Welcome back, and thanks for not going away. This is a fascinating program. I'm Kili'i Akina on Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii broadcast program. Think Tech Hawaii produces about 30 to 35 hours of original content right here from our studios in downtown Honolulu, and it's broadcast live across the world and then picked up in other venues and circulated. So we hope that you'll be tuning in, and if you like this program, simply watch it on your YouTube link and uh, share it. Other people can learn about this. My guest today is City Councilwoman Heidi Tsunayoshi, who's talking about her efforts to audit the rail through a forensic audit. We're going to pick up right away. Well, we're back, and I, I promised you that I would ask you to tell us a little more about what caused you, in terms of the data, to move forward with a, with a forensic audit. What, what potential evidence of fraud, waste, or abuse were you looking at? I think um, when I saw the audits and what came out of the audits, I think some of the main things that stuck out. Now you're talking about the state auditors. The city audit. and the state audits. Yes. Yes. Um, the change orders and the exorbitant change orders. Um, consult some of the consultant fees that I saw and continue to see for consultants that we're bringing in and the high cost of those. Well, and let's talk about change orders for a bit. Mm -hmm. For our viewers, that means once the contract is made, something has to be changed. Right. And. Uh, Sometimes that's a legitimate process. You know, we discover something in the way of the rail that has to be moved and so forth. But uh, obviously, these were quite exorbitant and showed perhaps some things had not been planned for. Correct. And I think for myself, like you said, change orders in a lot of big projects like this are not uncommon. There's a lot of variables that come up when you're doing a big construction project or any project for that matter. But the level to which the change orders existed and the magnitude of the cost of these change orders was very um, concerning to me. And either it was a purposeful situation or and or a lack of planning. And I think either case is not um, respectful of our taxpayer money because I think moving forward, what government really has to show the people is that we are willing to step forward and be good stewards of our taxpayer money. And that for me is what it's all about, is that we're showing the intent that we want to be good stewards of our taxpayer money. And um, in that light, again, with the consultant fees and bringing in consultants from all over at very, very high rates of pay is concerning, as this project was touted to the community to say, bringing so many local jobs to the communities. And there has been um, a, a good increase of local jobs, but there's also a lot of jobs that are um, high paying jobs that come from out of state and other places. So we're not realizing the benefits of those jobs. Now then, you've, you've had some concern about the necessity of some of the contractors. Correct. Now of Consultant. course in any project of this magnitude you want to have the best national and international expertise. Correct. But uh, you've been known to describe that as Consultants watching consultants watching <laughs> consultants. It's, uh, yeah, I just what, had, do you, what do you mean by that? Right. So just, I mean, just recently we had a committee on budget meeting and mm -hmm. the idea of the holo card came up, which the holo card is a card that they're going to be using. So it's a one swipe where you can use it for the uh -huh. bus and the rail. And within the um, identification of this holo project and what's going to happen in our budget, this upcoming budget for fiscal year 2020, there's a consultant for over $6 million to look into how to implement this holo card. And that's one consultant for over $6 million. So things like that, when I see it come up on the budget, it's just so concerning to me because the everyday person doesn't have time to go through the budgets and really line item by line item, what are we looking for? But I think that is the job of elected officials is to look line item by line item, what are we looking for? Is this really necessary? What is the benefit to the people? And at that price tag, is that really needed? So um, I think things like that, and a lot of times I think um, when uh, people are in government, you see millions of dollars come in and come out all the time. But for myself as a mother and a daughter, every dollar that we spend is so important to the people. So um, I think uh, government officials get used to just approving million dollar things all the time. Sure. But it's, it's such billion a dollar billion dollar things. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> millions and billions of dollars. But for me, every dollar really counts. So when I'm looking at the budgets, I'm looking line item by line item. And when I looked and became a council member and was able to do that, that's where the concern came. Because when you look at it as a whole and try to explain it, um, that, that detail isn't presented. So um, that detail is also sure. of concern for the P3 project moving forward as well. So all those 
together led me to think that we really do need to have a full on look at this with the forensic audit. Now, you just mentioned the P3 project, yeah. which is a catchword today, yes. a buzzword to say P3 when right. something's not very popular. A lot of times we create a public private partnership. Correct. And on the surface, it sounds very good because we've got the public sector government working together with the private sector to have a greater efficiency. And the truth is, it does come up with some great results. Mm -hmm. But sometimes, all P3s aren't healthy. Right. And you have some concerns about the proposed public-private partnership that the mayor has put forth right. as a means for financing and ending and finishing the construction of the rail. What is your, uh, what is your concern? So when I came in to start serving in January, uh, there was already um, agreement between the administration and the city council and HART, the Honolulu Authority for Rapid Transportation, to move forward to complete the last component, the last um, city center city center segment of the rail project through a P3, which is like you said, the um, partnership. Um, after coming on board, I really started asking questions about why would anybody want to come aboard with such a project that's so risky? What What is it? What is in it for them, if you will? And at that time, during discussions, it was um, told to me, and I went to a heart board meeting, that part of the P3 was an operation and maintenance component to where the, the person who was selected to do the construction would also be operating, doing the operation and maintenance for 30 years, which caused me great concern because now, in our yes. charter, the heart is only supposed to be confined to the construction of rail. So when I went to the board meeting and said, how is it possible about that we're doing a P3 with construction and O&M, now the conversation has changed to say, oh no, Hart is only dealing with the construction and the city is going to do the O&M operation and maintenance component of the P3. But this causes me great concern because how do you come to a contractual agreement with two different entities for one project? And so all of these things are just very, very concerning to me. Well, it certainly raises some questions. Right. And to the average taxpayer who may not know the difference between the two, it, it looks like something may be going on that could be a little bit sleight of hand. It, it, in the first instance, you talked about the operations and maintenance perhaps being added on as a sweetener for the deal. Correct. And that would raise a lot of questions about the contracting. And in the second instance, you talk about it being separated off as something the city manages. You know, one of my concerns is that whenever there's a P3, public-private partnership, there should be a balanced way of sharing the risk. But it looks like the one that's being proposed puts the risk on the taxpayer. Correct. Because the private entity doesn't have to really pay. Correct. They pay up front, and then they get paid back by the taxpayers. And as you know, our city is really willing at times to go after taxpayers, maybe raise property taxes, raise GE taxes, and so forth, and that's not a good thing. Exactly. The other concern that I have about the P3 is this. The private entity doesn't have to make it work. In other words, whether it's efficient or whether they make a pro whether the rail makes a profit or not, the private entity gets paid by the taxpayer anyway. Correct. And that takes away all the incentive, really, to make it very profitable, very creative, and very cost-effective. And so I think your concerns about the P3 are... are right on the money, and uh, what are you planning to tell the, the city council now about P3s? So uh, as you know, right now we're going through our budget process, and mm -hmm. within the budget we're looking at the heart, heart um, budget proposals. We have our upcoming meeting, actually this Wednesday is a special budget meeting. So we're gonna be talking about all the budgets, and I really wanna drill down and get information from heart, and now I guess the city administration, about the price tag for the operation and maintenance component of the P3 and the construction component of the P3, and how those are able to be put out together and let as one contract. And um, as you know, this morning in the Star Advertiser paper, there was, I did ask um, Hart to provide information about what it would look like to stop at Middle Street, thereby foregoing the P3 if we need to, if it is too risky for our taxpayers, because at the end of the day, what you're saying is exactly right, that the taxpayers are, are the one that's gonna be holding the bag either way. And for operation and maintenance, that part of the P3, my understanding is that's for a 30 year contract for operation and maintenance. And how do we finalize a contract for 30 years of operation and maintenance when 10 years were included in the current rail project with Ansaldo and then after that the city was supposed to take over operation and maintenance to give exactly what you said a sense of place a sense of belonging a sense of pride in this project that we take it over and really start owning this project and making sure we make sure it's a viable project for our people so I have concerns um, great concerns when we're drilling down to see get answers for that
Well, Councilwoman, one of the big questions that people have now is where do we go? Should we scrap the project altogether and go back to ground zero, tear it down? Or should we finish it to the end and make sure that the original vision is fully completed? Or do we stop it at Middle Street and save possibly, as the newspaper cited, a number $450 million, which may need to be tweaked, actually. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts about where we're going, what we should do? Well, like I told, um, was included in the article this morning that I think it is that time for that discussion. I think that we do need to look at, and, and as I even um, introduced the resolution 19-29 asking for the forensic audit, I made it very clear that this is not a for, pro, or against rail. As you said, a lot of people are beyond that discussion of pro or against rail. It's about the accountability of rail. So really where I think we need to go is get all the information so that we can make an informed decision and present that to the people to say this is the, the reality of what it is and no um, rose colored glasses and no um, leaving some information out for another day. Look at all the information right now before we decide what we can really do that is going to be a benefit to the people. I do believe that it, there can be benefits to the people by stopping at Middle Street. Um, a lot of people want to go all the way to Ala Moana, but we, I think we do have to look at all of those factors and what the, those means for not only this generation, but future generations. So um, really think that it's time to have that conversation and see where we need to do. And in the next few seconds before we close up, could you just tell our viewers why transparency is important? Over. Well, I think, like I said earlier, that we really need to show the taxpayers that this is our opportunity to show the taxpayers that we want to be good stewards of their money, that we understand that every dollar that they make is hard earned, that we do understand the high cost of living is making it hard for people to live here, and that we just want to make sure that people know that we're willing to do the work and ask the questions and make the informed decisions to create a better future. Well, Councilwoman Heidi Suniyoshi, thank you so much for thank being with you. us today. Thank Appreciate you. Thank you very it. much. Thank you for having me. My guest today has been the Councilwoman of the 2nd District of the Honolulu City Council. that She's been fighting for a forensic audit, and you've heard her right here on Hawaii Together. I'm Kili'i Akina, President of the Grassroot Institute. Until next time, on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network, aloha.